السلام عليكم الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد so uh, this weekend جزاكم الله خير is my first time doing a, I think I'm pretty sure, no yes I think it is doing the first time I'm doing an event in Birmingham and um, I'm very happy to see so many such a, a diverse crowd in front of me so I just want to start off with Everybody shouting out where you're from. So go ahead. Okay, so 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 out of all of that what I heard was France. So who here's from France? Okay, very good. What else do we have? Ireland, who here's from Ireland? Okay, very good. What else do we have? I mean, I mean, hold on. I meant countries, what countries are y'all from? Okay, so, okay, calm down, calm down. Okay, so for, for this to work, I need you guys to just calm down a little bit, okay? So who here is from Algeria? Okay, what else do we have? Who here is from Morocco? Okay, what else do we have? Egypt, Egypt. who's from Egypt here? All right, what else do we have? Nigeria, who's Nigerian here? All right, what else? Yemen, who's from Yemen? All right. Sudan. Sri Lanka. Who's from Sri Lanka? Okay. Okay, listen. It's literally two people from Sri Lanka and they separated. They just sat one over here and the other sat over there. And they're twins. Like, well, okay. What else? Pakistan. Who's from Pakistan? Pakistan. Is that everybody? Afghanistan. Who's from Afghanistan? Okay. Malaysia. Who's from Malaysia? Okay. All right, guys. Is that everybody? Who's left? Somalia. Who's from Somalia? Okay. What else? Tanzania. Who's from Tanzania? Okay, I think that's everybody. Ready? Uh, it's funny, like, people always say, like, the British are really reserved. Just get them to shout out their countries, and they will lose their mind. Okay, just to make it fair, is there anybody left? Tunisia. Tunisia, who's from Tunisia here? Okay. Madagascar, who's from Madagascar here? Okay. This goes like this, I, I heard Pakistan already, but did somebody say Palestine? Who's from Palestine? Okay. It goes like this. Afghanistan is my hometown, and Jerusalem is my heart. I flash a Madagascarian smile. I've been Egyptian from the start. My kindness comes from Pakistan, but my style. My kindness comes from Pakistan, my style is Sudanese. Yemen and Somalia join two continents at my knees. A Tunisian mind, a Tunisian mind, Algerian legs, but Arabian disposition. Moroccan passion, Moroccan passion. Huh? Oh, Moroccan passion, Sri Lankan fashion, and Malaysian precision. 
Wherever Allah is worshipped are my people, I conclude English esteem, French cuisine, American attitude. History in I have history in I have history in Irish soil and Nigerian sand, a future shining from Khorasan. My present is where I stand, my eyes peer from Kashmir. My eyes peer from Kashmir, that's India by the way. from Kashmir towards a Malaysian rising sun. My body's indivisible, I'm an ummah of one. Okay, okay, Jazakumullah khair guys. It's just the last session I promised y'all a poem, so. All right, alhamdulillah wa salatu salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. We were talking about, or today we're going to be talking about, inshallah, the love of the Prophet وسلم, and generally the adab with Rasulullah وسلم. And adab with the Prophet was defined by the scholars as being a number of things. Number one, they said, and you sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fima yukhbir. Number one is that the, they codified it into four things. The first is that he be believed in what he informs of. Number two, أَن يُطَاعَ فِي مَا يَأْمُرُ بِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم That he be obeyed in what he commands. Number three, أَن يُجْتَنَبَ مَا نَهَا عَنْهُ وَزَجَرْ That that which he prohibits be shunned and avoided and distanced from. And number four, وَأَن لَا يُعْبَدَ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَ لَا يُعْبَدَ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَ إِلَّا بِمَا شَرَعَهُ مُحَمَّدٌ صلى الله عليه وسلم And that Allah not be worshipped except with what the Prophet ﷺ has legislated. So it is to believe in him, in what he has informed us. Number two, that he be obeyed. And number three, that he be, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be worshipped with nothing other than what Rasulullah ﷺ came with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning of Surah Al-Hujurat, you see, in the ninth year of the Hijrah, after the conquest of Mecca, that is called the year of al-wufud, the year of delegations. That's when after Quraysh accepted Islam, all of the Arab tribes began coming to pledge allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and believed in him and they were sending delegations left and right. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was accepting delegations constantly in his city, in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, not everybody knew how to act and not everybody had the requisite reverence to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed some verses that we find at the beginning of Surah Al-Hujurat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yadayi allahi wa rasoolih, wa attaqu allaha inna allaha sami'un alim. Allah says, O you who believe, do not precede Allah and his messenger. Precede Allah and messenger in what? Preceding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger in your opinions, Preceding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger in his advice. Preceding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger in suggestions. You see, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would be approached by people. And they would say things like, Allah should reveal a verse about such and such. Right? You can imagine everybody who's got some sort of idea in their head. People love their own ideas. And so you can imagine somebody who has a beef with someone or an issue with someone or a pet peeve about someone. You know, I give khutbah all the time, and people always come, to, come up to me after khutbah, and they're like, you know what? Next week you should give a khutbah about this. And next week you should talk about that. And now you can imagine if they have a prophet amongst them who's receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever Allah reveals is going to be codified in law forever and ever and ever. And so Allah revealed this verse, teaching the sahaba the etiquettes of addressing the Prophet Sallallahu and the etiquette of approaching the Prophet Sallallahu Allah says, do not present or proceed Allah and his messenger, even though it's really an instruction about etiquette with the messenger. But Allah mentions Allah, why? To, to, to show 
the reverence that is due to the Messenger وسلم, that when you are preceding him with judgment, that you are preceding him with suggestions, you are preceding the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you are preceding Allah. Now, how does this manifest in our day and age? That you do not hold your own opinion before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That you do not precede Allah and His Messenger with your own thoughts, with your own inclinations, with your own experiences, with your own judgment, and that you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you submit to His Messenger in what they legislate. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He then says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. Allah says, O you who believe, do not raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, their approach to anything that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with was an approach of submission. Whether they understood it or not, they didn't make their intellect the metric through which they judge the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would recognize the place of their intellect that I come to the conclusion that this Qur'an is the word of God. After I have intellectually came to the conclusion that this Qur'an is from God, I then surrender my intellect to what is between the covers of this Mus'haf. After I have intellectually concluded that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of God, then I submit to the statements of that messenger. Abu Bakr who gave us an incredible example of this. Because on one night, the Prophet ﷺ in the 10th year of his bi'tha, after he had been sent as a messenger, one morning he awoke to the city of Mecca and he began communicating news that the mushrikeen said is too big to believe. He said that last night he had traveled on a night's journey from Mecca to Jerusalem and that he had ascended to the heavens. That journey that took them a month to go, the Prophet ﷺ was saying that he had went that night and came back, round trip. And so some Muslims even recanted their faith because it was just too difficult. And when the mushrikeen were spreading this like wildfire because he came with something big this time, they approached Abu Bakr and they said, your companion has come with some news last night, like even he's overdoing it. And so he said, what did he say? He said, he is saying that he went last night from Mecca to Jerusalem and back. And then the Prophet, uh, then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, in qalaha faqad sadaq. If he had said it, then he is speaking the truth. That's my, my concern is what? Has it been authentically reported that he said it? It's like in our times, is it authentically reported from the Prophet sallallahu And after it has been confirmed to us that it is authentically reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, indeed he did say it, then our response should be like the response of Abu Bakr, through which that response is how he gained the title As-Siddiq, the truthful one and the one who believes. If he had said it, then he's spoken the truth. There are going to be a hadith that you don't understand. We all have varying capacities in our intellect. And not only that, you yourself, there are things in your life last year you didn't understand, you understand this year. There are things that you don't understand this year that you'll understand five years from now. We all go through our own intellectual journeys. But my approach to the hadith, my approach to the verses of the Quran should never be, this doesn't make sense, I don't believe it. What doesn't make sense to you could make perfect sense for someone else. One of my mashayikh one time he was telling me, you know there's a hadith in Bukhari where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after everybody, or the Prophet sallallahu says, after everybody who enters into paradise, enters into paradise. There will be a portion of paradise that will still be empty. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create new creation to live in that extra part of Jannah. So a guy's reading this hadith and he's like, he said to my shaykh, he said, I don't understand. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create an empty part just to create new creation to live in it? That doesn't make sense to me. So the shaykh said, it, made, it makes perfect sense. He said, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do that? He said, to see if you would believe or not. To see if you would believe. Sometimes we don't know. And that's okay. But the idea is I do not present I do not precede Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. 
Number two, in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheen amnu. And again, you know, it's something very beautiful. I tell people this all the time. I took a class in British literature when I was in college. Unfortunately, we don't have the privilege of studying British literature through every stage of university and high school. I'm being very sarcastic, but I survived that semester. And that semester, I remember the professor, you know, we were studying like stuff like Wuthering Heights and uh, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And she used to make us analyze every little aspect of the text. If the character was a butcher or the son of a butcher, She'd be like, why did the author make this character the son of a butcher in particular? What does that communicate? And I remember like halfway through the semester, after all of these exercises, I just raised my hand, I said, Professor, maybe, just hear me out here, Professor. Maybe she just needed to give this person an occupation, <laughs> and she chose butcher. And then she said to me, we need to give the great, this is the part that I never forgot from that class. She said, we need to give the great authors of literature more credit than that, that they were more deliberate in their choices. And that was so powerful for me, not because of that particular approach to literature, that critical analysis, but that that's the way that we're supposed to approach the Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladheen amnu, at the beginning, verse number one. And then verse number two, he says, Ya ayyuhaladheen amnu, again, what is that to indicate? That is to indicate repetition. It is also to indicate inde in, um, endearment. Like when Luqman is always saying to his son, Ya bunayya, Ya bunayya, or Ibrahim alayhi salam in Surah Maryam is saying, Ya abati, Ya abati, Ya abati. Again and again and again, that's indicating endearment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again says, Ya ayyuhaladheen amnu. Do not raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Raising your voice over the voice of the Prophet happened during the time of the Sahaba. And it was said that this happened, Abu Bakr and Umar were arguing in front of Rasulullah and their voices were loud. They overwhelmed the voice of the Prophet Allah says, do not raise your voices over the voice of Rasulullah It may be that your actions will be nullified, voided, while you do not know. Who is this being said to? Two greatest companions ever are under this threat, as is every other companion. And there was a companion whose name was Thabit ibn Qais, one of the great companions of Rasulullah and he was the khatib of the Prophet. When delegations would come and everyone would send their own khatib to address the Prophet in the community, the Prophet would have Thabit ibn Qais stand up and, and address. And it would help, of course, that he had a very loud voice. He had a very powerful voice. The problem is, is that when Thabit is talking normally, his indoor voice is like some people's outdoor voice. And so Thabit disappeared for a period of time until the Prophet ﷺ missed him. And so he sent a companion to go find him and he said, oh, I know where he is, he's been at home. When he went to Thabit's house, he found Thabit there sitting in grief and saddened. And he said, what's the matter with you? He said, I'm afraid that my actions will be nullified. Why? He said, because my voice, I can't help it. My voice is always louder than the voice of the Prophet And so the Prophet وسلم, he told him, when the man came back, he said, go and tell Thabit that he is not from Ahlul Nar, rather he is from Ahlul Jannah. But this attitude was carried by the companions even after the death of the Prophet And so Umar ibn Khattab, one time he sees a group of people who are speaking loudly in the masjid of the Prophet and so he goes and he gathers them. And he says, where are y'all from? And they said, we're from a ta'if. And he said, you raise your voices in the masjid of the Prophet Wasallam. If you were from Medina, I would have punished you. Like you guys are supposed to know better. With respect to the Prophet Wasallam, the more respect and reverence a person shows to the Prophet Wasallam, the more Allah raises that person. You know, there are some names that have been that have been carried from one Muslim generation to the other. And they are revered. Malik ibn As Anas, Abu Hanifa, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Ash-Shafi'i, on and on and on and on. Imam al nawi Ibn Taymiyyah. These individuals do not think that they were lifted just by knowledge alone. But there was something in their heart. Imam Malik, his reverence for the Prophet is so well known, you'll find it, all of his books of biography, 
when his students would come to approach him, and he lived in the city of the Prophet, and he refused to leave it, and he would narrate the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Medina to khairun lahum lo kanu yalamun. Medina is better for them if they only knew. Even though if you've ever been to Medina, Medina doesn't have a lot as far as like extracurricular activities. It's no Cairo, it's no Baghdad, it's no Al Kufa, it's it's no Damascus, it's none of that. But there are people who love the Prophet ﷺ and love to follow what the Prophet ﷺ loved because that is one of the manifestations of love, that you love what your beloved loves. That's why celebrities get these big endorsements because they are loved and they know that the people who love them will love the things that they endorse and the things that they love. In any case, Imam Malik would be approached by his students and he would ask or his uh, servant would ask them, are you here for al-masail, are you here for fiqh, or are you here for hadith? And if they said we're here for fiqh, for Islamic law, then Imam Malik would come down ready. But if they said they were here for hadith, then he would go and he would bathe. And he would wear beautiful garments. And he would put on perfume. And then when he was ready, he would come down to narrate to them the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu and if he was asked why he would do that, he would say, because of honoring the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They would care so much reverence. You know, if a person learns a hadith in that type of state with that level of focus, that's a big difference between a person who's sitting in their pajamas eating cereal on YouTube watching a lecture. And then we wonder why, because it's not just about having a lot of knowledge. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says in a very beautiful statement, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the companions of the Prophet, describing the companions, he says, كانوا أكثروا, he says, كانوا أبر هذه الأمة, or he says, كانوا أفضل هذه الأمة وأبرها قلوبا وأعمقها علما. He said that they were the people with the most righteous hearts and they had the deepest knowledge. And he didn't say they have the most knowledge. You know what, this iPad here that I'm carrying has hundreds of books. I make, you know, I could make the, the, the library of, of, of Qurtuba or the library of Alexandria jealous. I could just sit, if I wanted to, I could download more titles than probably they had. But it's not about what you carry and it's not even about what you know, the breadth of it. But it is always about the depth of it. He said they had the deepest knowledge. One ayah or one hadith could penetrate a person and change their behavior and change their attitude and, 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 and trickle down into the very marrow of their bones when it comes to their iman. In a way that another person could have the entire Quran memor memorized from cover to cover and it doesn't affect them. And so it is about depth. And depth comes with the interaction that they had. Imam al nawi he has a book called at tibyan fi adab hamalat al-Quran, a wonderful book. The, clar the clarification of the adab, the etiquettes of the carrier of the Qur'an. Meaning a person who carries the Qur'an, a hafiz of the Qur'an, should not just be like an average person. Does the same corny jokes, carries himself in the same way. You should be refined by the Qur'an. You should be refined by what you know. The Qur'an should adorn your personality before it adorns your recitation. And at the introduction of this book, I was, there's a, a famous sheikh, Dr. Ayman Suwait, who did a, a, a commentary on this book. And I remember the first lecture that he gave. He's commenting on how Imam al nawi uses the pronoun about the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa And he says, sallallahu alayhi wa and he writes it out. And Dr. Ayman says, I want you to read between the lines here and just pay attention to something. He didn't say Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa and he didn't say Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa He said, huwa. He's using a pronoun. But guess what? He still wrote Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out of reverence for this individual. Do not think that these great Imams became great Imams. What differentiates one person from another? What makes one person's name carry it for hundreds of, hundreds of years over another? It is not just about knowledge, but it is something in between them and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Between them that they carry of love for Allah, of love for His Messenger, of willingness to sacrifice. And when you read about the seerah of the Sahaba, and not just the Sahaba, but the Tabi'een and the ones who came after with regards to the, we would think that they were actually like strange, like you wouldn't even believe it. Imam Malik was stung 16 times while narrating hadith by an insect. And he doesn't stop. And he's just grimacing and he's narrating hadith. 
And people watched him get stung. <laughs> and afterwards they said, what happened? Like, why didn't you get up and stuff? And he said, hadith Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam. Like it was to that level of respect and reverence that they have. It's something that's foreign to us. But of the manifestations of etiquette with the Prophet sallallahu undoubtedly, is that you don't make your calling of the messenger like how we call each other. I get very bothered when someone just says Muhammad. Who's Muhammad? Is that your cousin Muhammad? Or who are we talking about here? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even his wives would call him Rasulullah. And the most intimate relationships where a person, normally no matter what a person's title is, once it comes to his family, they just drop all titles, right? He becomes Baba, he becomes their first name by their spouse. But even the wives, not only the wives, but even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran never addresses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa by name. Did you know that? Everywhere else in the Quran, Allah addresses the other prophets by their names. Ya Yahya, khudhi al-kitaba bi quwa. Ya Zakariya, inna nubashiruka bi ghulami, ismuhu Yahya. Ya Isa, inni mutuafika wa rafi'uka ilayh. Allah again and again addresses the prophets by their names. But nowhere in the Quran does he ever say, Ya Muhammad, ever. It is always, Ya Ayyuha nabi Ya Ayyuha rasul O Prophet, O Messenger, showing the level of reverence, of the etiquette and the, the beautiful relationship that you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's a wonderful book, I'm not gonna have time to go into much today, but I'll refer some books to you. Of them is the great book by Al-Qadi Iyad, and it's translated into English, and it's called Al-Shifa Fi Ma'rifati Hukuq Al-Mustafa. The Andalusian scholar, Al-Qadi Iyad, and it is called The Healing. Or if you just Google Al-Shifa, which means the healing, in knowing the rights of Al-Mustafa. He talks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses such gentleness with regards to Rasulullah in his address. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, Afallahu an kalima adintalahu. There was a there was a judgment that the Prophet had made with regards to some hypocrites who had betrayed the Muslims. And when they came back from the conquest of Tabuk, the Prophet excused them all. He gave them permission and he excused them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, May Allah forgive you. Why did you forgive them? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala precedes his rebuke with the statement of forgiveness. Because he says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had started with the rebuke, that would have been too much for the heart of the Prophet sallallahu to bear. And so Allah proceeds by the statement of forgiveness out of gentleness to Rasulullah sallallahu And lastly, of the etiquettes with Rasulullah sallallahu is simply to love him. He says, you will not believe until I become more beloved to you than your parents and your children and all of mankind. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu who was once walking with Rasulullah sallallahu and the Prophet sallallahu held him by the hand. And Umar in that moment being held by the hand of the Prophet sallallahu he just felt so happy and he felt such love that he himself declared to the Prophet sallallahu and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I love you more than everyone except for myself. Everybody, my children, my family, everybody, except for myself. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, not yet, Umar, until I become more beloved to you than yourself. And then Umar who thought about it, and then he said, O Messenger of Allah, you are more beloved to me than myself. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-an ya Umar, now O Umar. What's the rationalization here? Who does Umar need more on the Day of Judgment? Himself or Rasulullah Sallallahu who does any of us need more on the Day of Judgment? The Prophet Sallallahu And so he is more beloved to us than ourselves. That a person follow Rasulullah Sallallahu that a person love him, that a person love his sunnah, and that a person seeks to love his sunnah. Yes, there are some things that are gonna be difficult for us, but the Prophet Sallallahu says, La yu'minu ahadukum, none of you perfect his faith, hatta yakunu hawahu taba'an lima ji'tu bihi. Until their very passions and inclinations become in accordance to what I have revealed, to what I have brought. Maybe at the beginning there's something that I don't like. Why are marshmallows haram? I don't get it. I hate it. But a person will come to a level where they will love what Allah loves. 
and they will hate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. They will love what the messenger loves and they will hate what the messenger hates. And this is something that is a beautiful journey that a person undertake. And there is a beautiful supplication that a person can make in their journey. That they say, Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman wa zayyinuhu fi qulubina wa karrih ilayna al-kufra wal fusuqa wal isyan wa ja'alna min al-rashideen. Oh Allah, beautify iman in my heart and make it beloved to me and make me hate kufr, disbelief and transgression and disobedience. That a person loves Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a person defends the Prophet. That a person defends the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That a person defends his sunnah. That a person defends his teachings. And that a person spreads his teachings. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً he says, narrate from me, even if it is one hadith. You don't have to be a hafiz of the Quran, and you don't have to be a scholar of Islam for you to go and narrate just one hadith. But narrate it with confidence. You know, probably two of our, our most popular in the, US, in the US, two of our most popular individuals in bringing Islam to the mainstream were Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. May Allah have mercy on them both. More than any sheikh or any scholar or any one individual. And I believe, as far as my anecdotal experience, that after the Qur'an, the book that brought the most people to Islam or made practicing Muslims out of non-practicing Muslims is the autobiography of Malcolm X. They weren't ulama at all, but what did they do? They were very confident in what they knew. Now, you've all probably seen Muhammad Ali say, Allah is my bodyguard, and he's speaking to a non-Muslim crowd, and we're amazed, we're like, wow, like he's so... But strength is attractive. And so speaking on behalf of the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, with strength, Allah says, Ya Yahya, khudil kitaba biquwa. Allah says, Oh Yahya, take the book with strength. With strength. Defending the Prophet. وسلم. And then lastly, of love for the Prophet وسلم, is to long to meet him. And how could you not long to meet him when he has longed to meet you before you were born by 1400 years? The Prophet ﷺ was once sitting with his companions and he said, I wish that I could meet Ahbabi. I wish that I could meet my beloved. And the Sahaba were like, aren't we your beloved, O Messenger of Allah? And he said, no, you're my companions. You are Ashabi. But my beloved are a people who will believe in me without ever having met me. And one of them would wish to meet me, even if they were to sacrifice their family and their wealth. If they could give it all up, they would wish just to meet Rasulullah ﷺ. And so he intended and desired to meet you. To be loved that early, that perfectly, that beautifully. You know, one time Aisha radiallahu anha, she caught the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a good mood. And so she said, oh messenger of Allah, make dua for me. She's taking advantage of the good mood. And he said, oh Allah, forgive all of Aisha's sins. Her future sins and her past sins, her hidden sins and her apparent sins. Aisha said, he made such a beautiful dua for me that I giggled until my head rested on his lap. And then he said, oh Aisha, are you happy with that? She said, how can I not be happy when you've made such a beautiful dua for me? He said, by Allah, that is the dua that I make for my ummah after every salah. The Prophet wasallam. I mean, there's a lot that can be said, but I actually want to end with... Uh, We'll take some questions, inshallah ta'ala. But before that, I do want to share one poem if we do have the time. Can we connect to the internet on this? Yep. This is a poem that I wrote about love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, good. Just uh, press play and put it on mute. You're the best person I've ever known. Put it on mute. Best? That doesn't even sound like me. It doesn't, right? It's auto-tune. Okay, you can press play now. You're the best person I've ever known. Best friend I've met. No, met. mute it. Go ahead, turn off the... You're sincere. I want you to play it, but turn down the volume. Everything to me is blind. Enough to completely challenge the world and change that. All the way down. Now rewind it. You're the best person I've ever known, the best friend I've never met. 
Your sincerity to me is blinding enough to completely canvas the world with drapes that read respect, honor, love, protect, while creating a window for me to zoom in on the important things, but those are the things that I forget or neglect. I will do better. Your ummah is fine, not because of me or mine or wounds that heal with time, those who would die for a dollar sign, but because a promise is divine. So when we feel like we're at our worst and our sadness would cause our hearts to burst, it feels like there are times when there are angels within our lights or hovering over squares with chance of freedom in the air. And though tyrants may step on our necks, we smile. For history has always been on our side. Yours is an ummah that simply does not die. I'm sorry for my weakness. For every time I've been ashamed of your name and asked someone to call me Mo. For not knowing enough about you to defend you when they drew cartoons or made movies or put you on the cover of magazines or accuse you with the most heinous of accusations for not getting over my distaste of reading and waiting for a Hollywood to put you on the big screen so I can know something about you. As if Steven Spielberg or Mel Gibson or Johnny Depp would somehow be able to recreate the twinkle in your eye or a beautiful bead of sweat as it scaffolds on your forehead, frantically fighting gravity, not wanting to fall off your body. I keep thinking of seeing you. And if you would smile at me, the thought gives me goosebumps. You told me to meet you at the pool. So on that day, I hope and pray that I will see you through the crowd that no angels barricade me as I sprint at breakneck speed. I hope you recognize it's me. I will crowd the companions to get access to your vision. I will obey my thirst by quenching it from your hands. So until that day, I will pray. I will stand and I will pray as if my feet are holding the earth from splitting. If I make it, I cry at the thought of seeing you. For I know that the words that I used to read from books with all too thin pages will do no justice to your voice and your face and your touch and your scent. So your voice and your touch and your face and your scent, you see, my messenger of Allah has always existed between the curves and dots of the Arabic alphabet. So Muhammad ibn Abdullah in 3D and wherever other dimensions the hereafter brings with it will be an overboard of senses. I will fall in love with your shadow. I will tell Ali that his description did not do justice. Tell my mother Aisha of how we heard her story of how you passed away between her chin and her chest over and over and over again, and it made us cry every single time because we never suffered any disaster that was greater than what we suffered before our souls merged with flesh, entering an earth that was without you. Does the sky even recognize us anymore? And I will sit in the shade of your smile and will ask you your story directly from your mouth as we sip on salsabil ice cold and would be terribly embarrassed if you ask me for mine, because I never did anything right other than loving you. And then, if you let me, I would love for a hug. Thank you, thank you. Uh, two things. I am now, because we have some guests from France, I'm going to recite that entire poem in French. Uh, all I know is aujourd'hui. That's all I got. Uh, no, that's... But the poems that I've been uh, sharing here and there are from a collection, actually, that I have brought with me, for those of you who are interested. This, this poem was called Until I See You, and the first poem was called Umma of One. And so... Uh, they're for 12 pounds, 50 cents. You can find me anywhere, inshallah ta'ala, and I'll sign them for you. Other than that, that's it. 